what are we on? We're on 9.27, so much to it. I've been talking for longer than I thought, so I apologize if I'm going on, but again, it's just, what I try and do is just talk in real world language about different things to make it uh, realistic and hopefully using examples that, you know, kind of uh, you understand, but you can always drop in the comments or just tell me if I'm terrible and, you know, need to understand it. But one of the things I was very keen to do is talk about other people that have been on their own journey, especially people that have done really well. And I've been doing a lot of homework recently, and one that really jumped out was a lady called Sarah Blakely, who founded Spanx. And what's really interesting is that whilst I don't have any particular interest in women's shapewear, which is what it is, if you don't know the company Spanx, um, it's a lot of, it's predominantly aimed at women, but I'm sure there's a, a male kind of range in there as well. And it's to help women feel confident in the clothes they wear. That's one of the things that they really kind of push. But what's really interesting is Sarah's story. So Sarah was a sales lady. She sold fax machines and she was good. And what was really interesting, actually, there was a case study where she would sell, uh, I think, was it Canon? Maybe not be Canon, but anyway, she didn't sell the premium famous brand of fax machine. And to do it pricing, what was quite interesting is that she would go door to door, cold selling to really knock on doors and say, look, we sell fax machines, can we buy a fax machine, etc." And this was probably in the 80s and 90s. And what was interesting on price was that people would always say, mm, no, I, I want to go for the trusted brand, which is more expensive. And what she then did, because she, I guess she had the rights to, was that she then actually started to price her products, even though it was the same product, at the same price as the competition and sales improved. But then actually what she started to do was actually price her fax machines, which was the budget brand, to be more expensive than the main leading competitor. And what that did was that it just allowed people to then sit up, take notice, and they actually started to ask the questions about actually, so, <laughs> why is this more expensive than that brand? And what it did, it almost to do with a pricing kind of, uh, you know, scenario, it allowed her the chance to qualify her buyers and talk to them and that kind of thing. But my point is, even before she started Spanx, she was a very savvy business lady that was working for someone else, but she had a passion and a dream. And then with $5,000, basically, she launched it from scratch. And then 20 years later, you know, she's a billionaire, but it's the way that she's done it is really, really impressive. So the thing with Sarah that I think is actually um, really interesting is that she started while she was working in a full-time job that, you know, a lot of us have been there. And actually I would kind of recommend that, that whenever you can launch your business and on the previous graph, when I drew it out, we all have, hopefully have some savings that if you were to launch your business, ideally you want a fair amount of runway so that when you launch, there is a definite time lag between when you launch to actually getting paid and getting paid regularly. So what Sarah did, which I think is a really good important lesson to learn, is that actually she started her business in her own time while she was still working. And she did that for two years. And even after she actually launched the product and got into some really prestigious uh, department stores, she kept working for another six months just to make sure it wasn't a blip, it wasn't a fad and see it was working. But the point is, the lesson for me that I wanted to share, which was the first one, is actually if you can and you want to start your own business, if, you know, balance it with working at the same time, just to reduce your risk on running out of cash. That's what Sarah did. That's what a lot of people did. I didn't, but I had some savings there that I was willing to use. But it's a really important lesson, and it's very risky to quit your job one day, then start from scratch, and then start selling. And that is where a lot of people go wrong, just because it's very difficult to do. What was then interesting was that this lady had $5,000 and what she wanted to do in inventing the product was create her own prototypes. So what she did was that she looked at the market, what was out there, what worked and what she did and didn't like. And although she had no particular fashion or design background, she knew as the consumer what wasn't working for her. So she quite literally was kind of making it herself, bootstrapping it. And going back to what I said before about how it's to get your minimum viable product out there, learn and improve is really important. That's what she did and what you know everyone else should do. But in that same process, the one thing that she was passionate about and still is, it's really understanding the needs and the drivers of the consumer, the person that could actually buy your product and then build everything you can around that rather than just coming up with something and then pushing it out. So with the Roadmap MBA, the fact that I've launched the uh, the live Zoom Q&A sessions that we're going to start and I'm doing them twice a week and I'm repeating them and doing this in the morning and even changing the whole kind of textbook look and feel is all about 
understand and listen to people and improve. And it's what she did and it's kind of worth doing, but she rarely was obsessed about the consumer. But then likewise, when she then went to sell to department stores, etc., she also rarely understood the needs of the buyer. So in this case, she double thought it through where she understood the needs of the consumer that would be the end product. But then because she wanted to sell via resellers, she spent a lot of time thinking about the person that buys hair product, what are their buyers? And one of the big things that she found was actually for uh, the big department stores, they sell you know expensive hosiery and that kind of thing as well. But hair product will make their consumers feel more confident and they're more likely to buy more clothes in the store and feel more comfortable in them. So she actually really identified that. And the driver to the big department stores to buy hair product was that she didn't just sell the margin of what she does. She sold the dream on what hair product could unlock for the rest of the store. And I just thought it was a very important lesson to learn. Again, when you do your sales approaches, B2B or B2C, if you really understand the needs of the buyer or the pain points, as I always call it, at the other end, it's a really important lesson to learn. So I've mentioned about being obsessive about the product. And this is something I relate to. I'm obsessive with everything that I do and I try and make it as good as it can be. But again, you should be too. And the idea is that even if um, you make a certain product and there's you know stiff competition in the market, if you can do it better than anyone else or you know deliver better customer service, even if it's the same product, people will buy from you and not someone else. And the more you kind of obsess about every little detail, and I think this almost comes about when you're passionate about something, but it's something Sarah did and I certain, uh, certainly try and do. Um, actually, interestingly, for the first few years, and bear in mind, Spanx grew to a billion dollar company and had celebrity A-listers and that kind of thing, but she never once paid for advertising in like the first 10 years. And what they're really focused on is actually all to do word of mouth uh, so it's how when you have hopefully fans of the product and they experience it, it's to build it and make the service good enough that hopefully people then talk to other people <clears throat> about what it is, how it works and how they can benefit from it too. And actually what's interesting is that in the book we talk about something called self-actualization, which is actually uh, when people feel good about themselves, but people love to share knowledge and almost feel that they have the inside track on something. So if you have something new and exciting people like to talk about it. And again, Sarah used that just word of mouth for years to really build the brand, build the momentum before she started to pay to advertise. I still think there's a balance to be had there, but the point is if you don't have the cash, you know, you don't have to spend it on advertising straight away. Really try and build a loyal following, really give the best service you can to your core group of people who will champion you and talk about you and social media and that kind of thing before you then, or as you grow the business, it will really help you kind of move forward. This is interesting. So with the brand positioning, so women's underwear is not something I have a huge knowledge about, but when I was reading up on about Sarah, is that she was completely unknown to the market. There is a lot of competition out there and you have different price points. So you have the uh, budget level, um, which is basically it's a race to the bottom. It's where you, know, you have a lot of manufacturers around the world that it basically just want to make it as cheap as possible. An issue you have there is that it's very high volume, low margin. It's not a great business to be in. You have mid-tier, which in her example was in the US, maybe people that might spend $10, $10 on a product, but it was still more functional. And at the time, uh, basically the premium end of the, of the market, which would sell in your Saks and your Macy's and that kind of thing, was selling for about $15, $16 per unit. When she launched Spanx, she purposely went in at 20 so she didn't even, even though she accepted and understood that the there was more expense, sorry, there was more established competition in the market from really big brands that she was going up against. She had belief that the value in what she offered far exceeded the price point. And then likewise, it then people started to ask the question, well, why is that more expensive? And it was a very clever sales tactic that arguably if she would have launched exactly the same product at half the price, people wouldn't have seen it as a premium brand. And again, I think this is almost really important when people look at their own pricing, is that the way that you both describe and build your product and how you position it, how you sell it and present it to the market is really important on how people feel about it. And again, it's something that they did. And you know, again, a brave move to launch a brand new product and actually make it the most expensive thing in the market. But it worked. And one thing that almost really kind of resonated with me 
was that on her evenings and weekends when she was working, she would get her product into a Saks or a Macy's or whoever, and she didn't just hope that sales came through. She actually went to the department stores and she would sell the crap out of her product. She would speak to every sales assistant. She would speak to people in the store and she was passionate about it and her passion rubbed off. But what was interesting was that she wasn't just selling to consumers. She was selling the brand and the dream and everything to the people that worked in the store so that even when she wasn't there, those people kind of, they understood it, they got it. And actually, when you have the passion and the drive to kind of really champion something, I was really impressed with that because when we mentioned before about how sales is often a dirty word, not everyone wants to do it, that, you know, that is ballsy, that is hustle. And, you know, fair play to her, but actually she did it and she put the time in. She didn't just create the product and then hope it took off. She really just kept selling and selling the dream. And actually one thing that is really important is all about your brand story. So she didn't just sell the functional benefits of what she was offering. She told it how it came about and what its mission was and what they were trying to do, and it worked. Next is all about when you have your product line. And I mentioned before, it's now gone off the board, but we were talking about how creating an ecosystem. <clears throat> In the Porsche example, their 911 is probably their hero product. And that's the one product that they champion more than all the others, which is the aspirational product. And one thing that Spanx did was that they had arguably the one product Yes, in different sizes and colors, but they're the one product which they championed for years and years and years. Really build the momentum, get people to know who it is, what it is, what it's all about, before they actually launched other spin-off products. In one of the examples that she gave, she was talking about inventory, because again, this is really important when you run a business that actually carries kind of stock, is that if you have a product which you launch, and even it really kind of takes off, the desire is always, okay, let's spin off and let's do tights and active wear and t-shirts and whatever. But what you can do if you have a too broad a product offering is actually people get confused. You don't really get the momentum and then it can die off. Plus it'll tie up a ton of cash. It's really difficult to manage delivery and inventory and everything on a much bigger thing. So if you can, for as long as you can, concentrate on one product, make it as good as you can and keep pushing it as your hero product and it worked for Spanx and hopefully it can work for you. What was also interesting was that within Sarah's business over the 20 years as it grew to kind of where it is now, that over the years they had the idea for certain products but they just didn't work and they didn't work because at the time the technology wasn't quite ready for them to actually launch it to the level it could be. And when I was trying to think this through to almost talk about it, is that for what I'm trying to launch with the business course, one of the main key elements in the USPs is all about the live stream and the interactivity and the Zoom and that kind of thing, that arguably even last year, it probably wouldn't have worked. Because even if you had live streaming capability, people weren't as comfortable having regular engagement on a screen in the way that they are now, because with the pandemic, it's kind of useful. But actually you might have the perfect product. It could also be the, the iPad, was actually first launched by Apple, what was it called, the Palm Pilot, years and years ago, and it just flopped, it just didn't work. Fast forward 15 years, people have got used to touchscreen interfaces with the iPhone, that was their entry to the market. And then when they relaunched the iPad, it really kind of took off. So again, even if you have a brilliant product or service, your timing is really important. And again, if you really believe in the idea, you know, you can always wait till better technology or stuff comes out to really kind of relaunch it. When next it comes to kind of talking about how you grow the business. So hopefully you have the point where you're starting to take off and hopefully this is where say I am at the moment is that on two sides to it. One is to recognize your strengths and what you're good at and where you're kind of best that way, you know, what makes you happy and then hire your weaknesses. So for instance, for me and again for Sarah, it was the, the finance side to really have someone to do the day-to-day -day operations and accounting was her weakness. And that was the one thing that she didn't really like to do and she wasn't that good at. So for any entrepreneur, find what you're good at, play to the strengths and then bring people in to plug your gaps, which is really important. But the other thing that she talks about is actually the need to hire slow. So try not to hire people until you absolutely need them because it'll be a massive drain on cash. But then if you do and it doesn't work out, don't be afraid as long as it doesn't break any laws or contracts or whichever. So it's hire slow and fire fast. It's what she did. If someone doesn't have the right cultural fit or they're just not the right you know, person for your business, 
don't carry it on for longer than you need to. It'll drag the team down, it'll cost you a lot of money, and it'll take a lot of focus. And again, the rules are different regarding HR in America as they are here, but actually it was a really important lesson that she wanted to share. I've mentioned about actually only thinking about the consumer, so I'm gonna jump onto the next one, which actually is maximizing your press and PR. This is something that actually got me thinking because if you have a product that you're genuinely kind of passionate about, and it could be anything, don't just uh, promote yourself via social media and stuff. That's great. But actually see if you can get on a local magazine, a radio, a blog, a whichever, and really trying to maximize as much free PR and press as you can. Because one of the things that we talk about in the course is all about social proof. And the way I would almost do this and what Sarah did was that you need to get enough social momentum that you have a small number of fans that really like what you do and give you testimonials and that kind of thing. That's almost the, the tipping point to get know that you're on the right track. But then once you actually have that, it's to then you know purposely write to magazines, tech reviewers, anyone you can think of, and offer for them to you know promote your stuff. And I guess this falls down to kind of micro influencers. And that yes, if you have a PR company that you work with, get them to it on your behalf. But you know, ask to be on people's podcasts and just get yourself out there as much as you can. You should actually be able to do a lot of it for free, but use this as a way to sell your brand story, who you are and what you do. And actually, I think this is as relevant to an engineer and firm that does condition monitoring for offshore wind as it is to someone that sells coffee or whichever. There will always be an audience for your, your niche and your product. And I think actually maximizing PR and free PR is something to definitely do. But likewise, if you don't have time to do that, or that's not your strength, there are some really great companies that you can use. But the more you can get the word out there, the more successful your company will be. And then last but not least, actually, was something that she mentioned is, is to just keep learning, keep developing, keep an eye out to what's going on, look at the competition, see what they do, see how they work, see how trends change. One of the conversations I had yesterday was all to do with uh, sustainability, that actually, you know, a lot of people now have buying drivers that they want to know that a company has green credentials and they're passionate about what they do and you know they look after the environment and they treat people well etc and that is a change which has happened over time in the course we cover it under like pestle analysis but again you know when sarah went from herself part-time five thousand dollars to with the first prototype to a billion dollar company that sells all over the world and she's been on the oprah room free show and stuff but the one thing that she always did was kind of keep learning I think that for me was almost quite inspirational just to, you know, when you see someone that's at the top of their game to really kind of be very humble in her approach. Um, yes, she is very media trained, but I guess she would be after so many years. But I just thought she was a really inspirational lady that I wanted to kind of talk about and share. I've just seen from the clock that I've been talking for 17 minutes on this uh, entrepreneur in America who is a wonderful lady. She's a mother. She does all this kind of great stuff. But I guess the fact that I'm even talking about it means that I've bought into her, her mission, her products, and I'm telling more people that, again, it's spreading the word on the brand, and it would be brilliant to do that for your business as well.